Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, in 2003, the Indian author Arundhati Roy said, another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. It's been 10 years since that statement. And the question we are discussing today is, what does this new world look like in terms of 21st century environmental protection? I have with me a distinguished panel of speakers. We have Commissioner Daniel Etsy from the Connecticut Department of Energy and the Environment, Environmental Protection, Simon Upton, the Environmental Director of the OECD, and Kumi Nadu, the Executive Director of Greenpeace uh, uh, International. You can read more about them in, their, in the speakers' bios. And how the panel will proceed is I'll ask two questions of our speakers, and they'll try to keep the answers short, so there's plenty of time for question and answer from the audience. So first, uh, I'll start with, with Daniel. What is the new paradigm for environmental protection, and how does this differ from 20th century environmental protection? Um, Zinta, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. And um, I guess what I would argue is that we have a a 20th century approach to environmental protection that's centered on what's known as the command and control approach to regulation, where the government mandates uh, specific outcomes, uh, specific control of emissions and, and certain levels, uh, and sometimes even specific technologies, certain pollution control devices have to be put on. And I think that uh, approach, which is largely a legal framework model, and uh, one that has evolved over time and has frankly produced great results, um, but has, I think, begun to hit the point of diminishing returns. And it has certain features that I think now are slowing progress on further environmental protection. Uh, in particular, it is not very good at driving innovation, which I think is absolutely essential to further progress. It is adversarial in its structure towards the regulated community, towards business in particular. And I think uh, the new model needs to engage the business community rather than uh, hold a stick over business leaders. And I think the new model needs to be sharper in the incentives it puts in front of people to do the right thing, to reduce emissions, to manage waste properly, uh, and to drive for solutions. In my approach, which I sometimes call Green to Gold, which is a book I wrote a few years ago. The real key is to get businesses to change not only their own behavior, but to solve their customers' environmental problem. And that has proven to be a very big strategy. And uh, it also requires change in many other segments. Uh, it's a particular thrill to have Kumi Naido uh, of Greenpeace here, because he too has had to remake his organization and one of the exciting things to see is how Greenpeace, famous for its direct action and protests, and for those who didn't watch overnight, uh, they were uh, doing their business in the Arctic. And Kumi may tell you, I, I, I fear that some of his uh, troops have been taken uh, by Putin's army and are not in a good place today. But the other thing that's fascinating about Kumi and the Greenpeace of today is how they have themselves begun to engage business. And I hope he will tell you about how he partnered with Coca-Cola to really lead the world towards a reduction of chlorofluorocarbons in refrigeration. A phenomenal example of how a partnering approach changed behavior. So I do think we um, have come to a, a, a bit of a dead end on the current approach. Um, and by the way, again, the US and Europe have made enormous strides in bringing down emissions, and some parts of the developing world are making progress. The air today is much cleaner. I remember being a student at Oxford. You could smell the coal burning. Um, you could smell the auto factory at Ifley. Um, you cannot do that anymore. The water across much of the developed world is much safer and more drinkable. Waste is better managed. Uh, chemicals are being at least identified, if not fully controlled. But I think we do need now a new model for the 21st century, and here are the six elements that I think are at the core of it. First, as I suggested, is the need to engage business and put the entrepreneurial spirit of business to work in solving problems. So the key in my mind is to set up a framework of incentives that gets the business community to do the work we need done of environmental protection. Now, in large measure, that means we need to harness market forces. We need to put economic incentives in place in particular and use that to shape behavior. It doesn't mean, by the way, we walk back if businesses are badly behaved. 
There should always be an enforcement threat. But the question is, what's the primary tool and what's the primary mode of engagement? So I say move from a legally oriented approach to an economically oriented approach, a threat and adversarial <clears throat> approach to an engagement and partnership approach. Again, I hinted at this, but my third element is innovation. We need to structure incentives to drive innovation, not only technology development, but innovation in policy frameworks, innovation in how we finance investments in clean technology and clean energy, innovation in how we solve problems. Fourth element is that we need a lighter structure of regulation without lowering standards. So the critique of the existing model is that it got too heavy, too bureaucratic, too slow, too inefficient, too expensive. And what we ne now need, I think, is to streamline, particularly in an era of limited government budgets. So in Connecticut, where I'm the commissioner of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, we borrowed a page from industry and have done lean reviews of all 26 programs that we do permits through and 24 other systems that we manage. So the lean approach requires you to take apart a system, identify all the pieces, and then literally take out any non-value added elements of a process. And by doing that, we've been able to compress and streamline dramatically our permitting programs. Things that used to take nine months now take nine weeks. When I got to the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, it took 14 months to get a permit to replace a dock. I, in my first week, said, I want this done in 14 days. After the review was done, it takes one day, as long as you're fitting into the same footprint, same ecological impact. So a lighter structure is, I think, critical. Faster, more efficient, more user-friendly. Fifth point is we need to take much more advantage of information technology. Almost every other segment of life has been radically reformed in the last two decades by the digital revolution. The environmental arena is curiously under attended to when it comes to bringing information technology to bear. So I see big opportunities for marrying information technology to environmental challenges. It allows us to do many things. For example, in a permitting process, the old approach is a manila file folder moves from the first reviewer to the second reviewer to the third reviewer and the sign-offs are done on a manila file folder. The modern information technology approach is to have all six of those people parallel process on an electronic file. Moves six times faster. So those are the kind of changes we need. It also allows for much greater public engagement, public participation, greater transparency. And finally, I would argue, sixth element of the new model is we need to be more data-driven and empirical. We need to use the power of not just information, but statistics, <clears throat> metrics, indicators to track problems, and frankly, to benchmark regulatory performance, to understand who's leading, who's <clears throat> lagging, and what the best practices are. It is a really good strategy simply to pick best practices from across all the jurisdictions that are regulating and try to disseminate them. Don't need new rules, new regulations, simply telling people what's worked in other places, particularly other places that are like their own place. And that strategy, I think, is already evident across the world. So I do see a 21st century approach to environmental regulation, environmental protection emerging, one that is quite different than the 20th century approach, builds on the 20th century approach, but offers promise for getting us further down the track to the kind of world that we all want to live in. So thank you for listening. and. Take it away, Simon. Okay, well, you're not going to expect uh, the Director of Environment at the OECD to disagree with the prescription uh, because the OECD spent the last 40 years, which is how long it's been working on environment, advocating these sorts of solutions. So um, let's make that clear at the outset. Um, market mechanisms um, are effective and powerful because they convey very transparent information. And, and the point you made about information uh, is, is central. Uh, so if you can use market mechanisms, you have a, a very powerful instrument. Um, just stepping back from my role, uh, where I uh, um, really run an observatory of these things, and we, we watch what countries are actually doing, as distinct from what a few enlightened individuals are advocating, uh, it's a much, much more difficult thing, and I'm not sure we have any paradigm shift 
underway at all. It's interesting to hear an optimistic, visionary and enthusiastic American talking. He comes from a country which has really believed in technical standards passionately. Um, it's a completely different regulatory world from what exists in other places. So others haven't been quite in this world to move away from, but I'm not saying that they've been in a market mechanism world. They've actually probably been in a bit of a muddle sort of world. But to go back to my point, market mechanisms are very, very powerful because they convey very transparent information, and those benefiting from them, but also those being affected by them know exactly what it means, and interests are at stake. Now, I was for 20 years a politician and was for 10 years an environment minister, and I can tell you from my own experience that where property rights are at stake, they are defended to the last, both in terms of taking them away and in terms of conferring them once they've been conferred. And so we're living in a world where there's a lot of advocacy and interest in and, in fact, practical experience of emissions trading mechanisms around uh, emissions for climate, greenhouse gases. And all I can say is that if you look empirically uh, at the evidence, uh, every emissions trading scheme that's ever been put in place has been subject to so many carve-outs and so many dilutions and so many ways of ensuring it doesn't have the impact it was intended to have that you can end up with some fairly weak price signals. Now, I'm, I'm not belittling them. They've still had a big impact. But a lot of their impact is around the fact the business is thinking, if these guys got serious, we might be in trouble, so we better change. But you're always gaming the margin as to how far you think the thing will go. As I say, politics is all distributional. And at a certain point, it's worth investing a very large amount of money in explaining to governments why this transparency, this powerful instrument, needs to be uh, abrogated, needs to be modified, needs to be softened at the edges. Now, I come from New Zealand, and my country has just put in place what is, without question, by far the most sophisticated market mechanism for non-point source water uh, discharge that I'm aware of, which is concerning nitrogen entering a big lake. Now, it took 10 to 15 years of politics to negotiate our way to a solution, which was to reduce the input of nitrogen by 20%. And it's a superbly sophisticated scheme. But to get it in place, taxpayers had to spend $80 million. And we had a New Zealand dollars, which for a small country is a lot of money for just one lake. And we had a meeting the other day, and, and the question was asked of the New Zealand delegate, this is all you know, fantastic, are you planning to use this mechanism, you know, the plans to roll this mechanism out? Um, no, they weren't. Because the asymmetry of information between these enlightened regulators and the people who actually use the resource is enormous. So, you know, I, there's a real question about, about gaming here. Take another economic instrument, um, and that is taxes. And, and these are pretty effective things in terms of taxing for the externalities of fuel all around the world, with two exceptions, uh, three exceptions the UK, the US, and Switzerland, but everywhere else from what we can see, diesel has less tax on it than a gasoline. Um, and that happened in another world and another time. And there's all sorts of arguments put up for diesel, but there's, and the OECD has actually said this, there's absolutely no environmental case whatsoever for giving diesel a break. In fact, it should be taxed more heavily. Uh, the, 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 but not just the, it's not just the, the, the global consequences, but the local consequences. But you try and tell people who have invested billions in technology around something uh, that, in fact, that was wrong, we should change it. Very, very hard to do. So taxes, highly transparent. But once they're there, those, those margins, those rights get, get defended uh, to the end. So I'd say that if you want to go down the road, which, which uh, we advocate at the OECD, and people like Dan uh, implement, you need superb information, absolutely agreed, and of course, that information in the hands of consumers is particularly powerful, uh, the users of stuff, but you also need absolutely independent institutions that can stand up to those who argue with superb science, enormous reason, and reasonableness, that in fact, the distribution should be otherwise. So I don't actually think it's a paradigm change. I think it's catching up with the reality of the information age. I'm not sure the results will be any bigger than they were under the regulatory world.
Okay, thank you. I'm reminded that for a moment during the liberation struggle in South Africa, if you were the last person on the panel, you started by saying, most of the really good points I want to make... <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been made. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and then you said, I've been eloquently made by the previous speakers. <laughs> and then you said, however, for emphasis, and then you spoke for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you got four minutes. Uh, I got four minutes, so... <laughs> So, so let me say that what I'm going to do is come at it from a slightly different angle. I'd, I'd like in the question and answer time to enter the question of market mechanisms and so on, but just to bring a different frame to the conversation. Uh, I will say quite controversially that all of us are suffering from a really bad case of cognitive dissonance, right? We are in denial about how, in fact, we are right at the precipice of disaster and in fact, our response to that disaster is actually incremental and way below what is currently necessary. To give you a quick walkthrough, in, with regard to climate and energy, the world was told that the Copenhagen summit in 2009 in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen, of course, <laughs> which some of us began to call Floppenhagen by the end of it, but that's another thing was to deliver to the world what was called a fab deal. Not a fabulous deal, but a fair, ambitious, and binding climate agreement. What we got out of Copenhagen was actually a flab outcome, full of loopholes and bull. Right? <laughs> Basically, the science was telling us that we needed to get emissions to peak by 2015 and start coming down thereafter. And our political leaders and our business leaders, to a large extent, have just taken a view that actually we can change the science and we can ignore the science because essentially where we are with climate negotiations now is that our political leaders are talking about only reaching a deal in Paris in 2015 at the next uh, at the climate negotiations. And then they are saying they will only start, assuming they get that deal, they'll only start implementing that uh, serious emissions after 2020. So let's be very clear that what we are seeing around the world today is a sign that climate change is not something that's going to happen in the future. Lives are being lost now to the tune of close to 500,000 lives being lost directly from uh, climate impacts. We are seeing, for example, some of the things that even not a very revolutionary organization such as the CIA and the Pentagon warned us in 2003 that in fact the biggest future threats to peace and security will not come from conventional uh, threats or even terrorism, but will come from the impacts of climate change. And when you look at a thing like what's happening in Darfur, that is in fact your first big resource war that was actually climate uh, induced. So let's be very clear, impacts of climate change are happening. But the sad reality of who is paying the first and most brutal price are those that have been least responsible for emissions. And that is one of the changes that we need in the environmental discourse of the 21st century is to insert a notion of justice into the conversation. Because today you will hear a term called climate justice, where we are saying, for example, in the climate negotiations, when we say to rich developed countries that you must put $100 billion a year uh, in a green climate fund to help with some of the things that uh, Dan and uh, Simon spoke about. These uh, things are not done on the basis of asking for charity from the developed world. We are saying that you built your economies based on carbon, you owe the developing world a carbon debt, and you need to actually help developing countries not have to follow the same dirty energy pathway that you follow to build your economies because that's going to be super disastrous and what's happening in India and China right now tell you that in fact we are really heading for disaster because India and China are basically mimicking the development path that uh, the rich countries and the developed countries of the world follow. So the one big change that we have to make in our narrative and our thinking is also, uh, even for the environmental activist movement, uh, is to break the dichotomy between development and environment. Be uh, or be because essentially, uh, for example, when I started at Greenpeace, because most of my background is in the anti-poverty movement, 
And when I started, the journalists were asking me on my first day on the job, so you're selling out on the anti-poverty movement and you're joining the environment <laughs> movement. And my response is the struggle to end global poverty and the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change and ensure environmental security must be two sides of the same coin. Let's be very clear. Mm -hmm. It is the poor that suffer most when environmental disaster hit. Even in a rich country like the United States, if you look at Hurricane Katrina, which was a sort of a, a, a major disaster, the rich people jumped in the four by fours and drove away. The poor people were left to die. Right? And I can give you several other examples. So we have to begin to draw on something that the women's movement taught us decades ago, a very powerful notion, but a rather cumbersome word, intersectionality. Unless we begin to understand the intersections between peace, human rights, development, and environment, we do not have a chance to address any of them effectively. And our political leaders, sadly, are locked into a very uh, conventional box of thinking and policy making, and we have to help them break out of it. The second thing, quickly, I would say is that for the environment movement, we are challenging ourselves about what we can deliver in a context where we are running out of time, not only on climate, by the way, if, just to take oceans for a second. Not Greenpeace or not WWF or any other environmental group, but Newsweek, <coughs> not necessarily the most radical environmental uh, magazine in the world, in April last year ran a feature coverage and a front page which said, in four decades, because of human greed, all that will be left in our oceans is algae and jellyfish because we are suffering a triple whammy in our oceans. Overfishing, dumping of toxics, including oil spills, and ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is as a result of carbon emissions. Excess carbon, too little forest to absorb it, it's landing. I mean, think about that. 40 years. I mean, some of us, if we're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, will still be around, right? Uh, so we are looking at a absolute absence of inter -solidarity, intergenerational solidarity. We the adult leadership of the world is governing in a way as if we don't have children and grandchildren and their children coming. So my last point in conclusion of what needs to change. Uh, uh, thank you, Dan, for highlighting the fact that since I've been at Greenpeace, I've spent a huge amount of time with the business community. We've got some successes. Where basically, the approach that we are taking at Greenpeace is no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. So if... <laughs> so, so, <laughs> So basically, I mean, we don't recommend that in your private life, but in your public life. <laughs> so in our public life, I can, so, so uh, the case that Dan talked about is an example of where we appealed to the CEO of Coca-Cola and the CEO of Unilever, got them to agree to work with us to eradicate these hydrofluorocarbons, which are worse than carbon dioxide, by the way, that comes through mass refrigeration got them on board, and then I sat down with both of them and said, listen, there's 14 other players, CEO of Walmart, Pips, Pepsi Cola, and so on. And I said, you know, we can wage campaigns against all 14 of them. It might take us two years, we'll win all of them. But we don't have the two years to lose. So then what we did was we said, listen, these are your peers. You call seven of them, you call seven of them. I just had to make sure Pepsi Cola was not on the Coca-Cola CEO's <laughs> list. Uh, and basically, when the... <laughs> Consumer Goods Forum, which is the umbrella body that works, Greenpeace activists, uh, Coca-Cola staff, as well as uh, Unilever staff, were all working together to get all the other businesses on board. But we must be quite honest and brutal here. We must be brutal in our honesty. What does history teach us when humanity has faced a big challenge and a big uh, injustice, whether it was slavery, apartheid, a woman's right to vote, civil rights in the United States, and so on. All of these struggles, which I will argue, pale into insignificance when you think about what climate change means, because it threatens the entire species as we know it. And But what history teaches us? Those struggles only move forward when decent men and women step forward and said, enough is enough and no more. We prepare to go to prison if necessary. We prepare to put our lives on the line necessary. So as Greenpeace, we are totally committed to working with partners in business and government. But we feel morally obliged that if those in, who have power in government and business think that incremental baby steps are going to actually secure our children and grandchildren's future, when that's clearly not the case, then we will use 
peaceful civil disobedience and we will do so without making any objection and right now as Dan mentioned we have just occupied the Russian the first rig in the Arctic that's about to start drilling and just understand the only reason that those companies are in the Arctic is because of climate change and is, is because of emissions and because the ice is melting in the summer months and so on and right now as we speak the Russian authorities have uh, arrested the ship and all 30 crew and we don't know their status because they've cut out all contact with them in that remote part of the world. But I end with saying that I might have sounded very optimistic, uh, pessimistic <laughs> but, uh, because I was speaking in the United States, I was speaking in the United States and I was talking about where we have oceans, forests and so on and an irate person in the audience put up their hand and said, Mr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? I said, yes. And then they said, do you know what his most famous, famous speech was called? And I very tentatively said, because I thought it was a trick question, I thought, I have a dream. The person said, yes, it was called I have a dream. It wasn't called I have a nightmare. When you speak, <laughs> when you speak it sounds like you have a nightmare. So to end with a positive quotation from Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi once said, Mahatma Gandhi once said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. From our perspective as Greenpeace and the broader environmental movement right now, they're not ignoring us, they're not laughing at us. By God, they are fighting us in the courts, uh, surveilling our uh, intelligence, uh, detaining our staff, deporting our staff and so on. And that I think is good news if Gandhi was right, because that means we are just one step away from winning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you, for uh, Dan for mentioning some promising step ways forward, Simon for raising some skepticism about this, and Kumi for both being pessimistic and ending with an inspirational uh, message. Um, some people have said, I'd like to zone down, just to give very quickly one example, um, to focus on one example. Uh, some people have said that environmental protectionism and, and sustainable development risks becoming a term that's just fashionable at cocktail parties, that really we're not going to see change on the ground. And if you look at climate change, um, there in the UNFCC negotiations, you do have talk about loss and damage and justice. But very little action is actually changing on the ground. We're not going to meet the two degree target. So let's look at clean energy. We, need, we all know that we need clean energy, uh, improved energy efficiency on a global scale. Can you, uh, the three of you, quickly give some ideas about how we actually achieve clean energy on a global scale, just very briefly before we go to the audience. So I actually think Kumi said something that uh, I want to pick up on and support. Um, my governor, Dan Malloy in Connecticut, concluded that Kumi was right and he integrated energy and environment. So I'm the commissioner of not energy, not environment, but an integrated department of energy and environmental protection, D-E-E-P. And I like to joke that I spell it with three E's because it really is energy, the environment and the economy. It needs to be seen as an integrated package. Mm. And I frankly think that we have, uh, again, a 20th century model of how to pursue clean energy, how to address climate change, that centers on uh, global ambitious targets and timetables that never seem to get negotiated and certainly don't get fulfilled. So I've tried to take a step back and, and to your, an your questions into, and really focus on getting on the ground change to happen in the jurisdiction I have responsibility for, Connecticut. And I'm doing it by really changing the model to focus on a different way to promote clean energy. Not the government picking winners, which we've done very poorly on. We don't pick technologies well, industries well, companies well. Uh, again, for those who don't know, the United States has actually bet $20 billion in the last 15 years on a clean energy pathway. It just happens to be so bad, no one knows what it is. Some of you may. It's corn-based ethanol yeah. as an alternative fuel. And I just said I'm not willing to pick winners, but I am willing to pick a loser. <laughs> that is a loser of a strategy. It doesn't actually get you very far on energy. Uh, it, it displaces food. It's, a, a, frankly, a flat-out mistake. So I would argue it works, well, it works for the farm states. <laughs> and why do we have it? Because the presidential primary process of the United States begins in Iowa. Um, so this is all about politics, to Simon's point, about the practical difficulties of moving forward and very little to do with good policy. So my approach is to move away from <coughs> subsidies and picking winners to creating a platform of finance. 
using limited government money to leverage private capital. <clears throat> and the key to clean energy, both energy efficiency, by the way, which is your first investment, as well as renewable power, is to try to create a flow of private capital. So we've set up a green bank in Connecticut to try and make that happen. We've set up a structure of incentives and ways to try to de-risk investments in clean energy so as to promote the flow of capital into these investments that are needed, into the spirit of innovation that I think is critical, and into deployment of clean energy on the ground. So while we sit here today, uh, I am buying $2 billion worth of renewable energy uh, by the time we finish. I think the, the deal will be signed. Uh, so this will be wind power, solar power, um, at a scale unprecedented in New England, uh, only seen in the United States and California. And it's all about moving from an old model of targets to a new model where we're going to sign 20-year power purchase agreements that are actually financeable. With that commitment, that contract, you can go to a bank and borrow the $100 million you need to build uh, wind turbines or large-scale solar arrays. Uh, I've done this with a competitive process that is going to drive down the cost of these renewable <coughs> projects to a level very close to the existing fossil fuel structure. And it's going to do so in a way that I think is going to engage the public in wanting to go where Kumi says we must go, which is a very different energy future. And I think as long as the clean energy is expensive, the amount of the public willing to go is small. If the premium is small, the amount of the public willing to go is big. And so that's my focus, drive capital into clean energy. Um, let me just, I think, correct something you've said, and that is that there's, there's not a lot happening. Um, there's a huge amount happening, a huge amount happening. The question is whether it's coherent. Uh, and again, from the position where we are as an observatory of what's going on, there are just there's, there's, there's a hail of government uh, actions. Uh, the question is whether they're coherent, whether they actually add up. Um, there are simultaneously things designed to put a price on carbon and in exactly the same jurisdiction subsidies to make sure that it's cheaper. Uh, and that exists both on the consumption side and on the production side. So I think the question isn't that there isn't a lot of activity. Uh, it's, a, it's really a question of joined up thinking. And I think to pick up your point on uh, climate, uh, yes, you're right to say this is the, the big existential challenge at the global level, but I don't think looking at climate alone uh, is particularly helpful. Uh, one has to look intersectionally on the environment side uh, because it's all to do with the way we live. It's to do with our, our demand for things, for consumption. I just used the porta loos behind here. Um, they are very nice, I, I just remarked. Uh, to a colleague that they uh, really, by port standards, are late Roman. And if you haven't seen them, go and use them. Um, but but, but we, just, we just want things, but we use the planet as a sink. Now, until you actually integrate natural resources and our reliance on them, and in particular, the most scarce resource of all, which is the planet's capacity to absorb waste, unless you actually integrate that, price that into economic decisions, uh, we will go on, uh, we, will, we will fail to make, make progress. So what, we, what, what we're trying to do, and the job that I do, is to encourage countries to think about uh, what we, we call green growth. And I hate slogans, and it's not a slogan. It's actually an accounting-based tool, ultimately an indicator-based tool, to try to encourage governments to assess everything they do in terms of economic progress in a way that takes full account of the claim on resources and the waste flows associated with them. So that we are in a position to say, well, it looked like growth, but you have to subtract uh, the following. And until we move to that, I think we'll have a lot of incoherence. I mean, just one other quick comment. The, the, the trouble with the environment is that there's so many issues going on that, and, and they're all highly, highly specialised, that you end up actually wondering where to start. And, and it's bad enough in extremely rich, advanced societies, which have huge ministries and huge resources, and, the, and frankly, the, the information to create these market mechanisms. I mean, the, these, are, these are information intensive. If you want market, market mechanisms, that, you, know, you can do it in Connecticut. You cannot do it 
in most of Africa. You cannot do it in large parts of Asia. Uh, you can't do it in many OECD countries. These are expensive um, things uh, to do. So, so we have to, we, we somehow have to simplify it. And I'd say that anyone who wants to be serious about this should just focus on two things. If, you know, if we're, in the, if we're at the edge of the cliff, there are two things that have to be made sustainable. One is the way we mobilize energy, and the other is the way we feed ourselves. I don't say forget the rest lightly, but if we just made progress there, we'd make dramatic progress. For energy, it means eliminating fossil fuel emissions to the atmosphere by the second half of the century. Eliminating, not low, not lower, eliminating in the second half of the century. And on the food front, uh, it means conserving the soil and reducing the flow of nutrients to water, to lacustrine bodies, rivers, and coastal ocean environment. Uh, dramatic improvements in efficiency. We can't not interfere with the planet to feed ourselves, but we have to dramatically reduce the footprint. Focus on those two things. I don't care how you do it in the way. We will make some progress. Okay. Uh, I agree with a lot of that. Uh, I mean, we at Greenpeace have been pushing together with about 30 think tanks and so on for more than a decade now what we call an energy revolution scenario. That scenario basically shows that by 2050, on a country-by-country -country basis, we can, if we get real political will, by through two sets of strategies, one energy efficiency and the other serious investment in rene renewable technology options, that we can, by 2050, reduce our dependency to as much as 80% on fossil fuels. Now, let's be very blunt about what the facts tell us, right? Facts are kind of inconvenient things when we're talking about particularly climate change, but I agree with your point about it, it should be connected. Um, so, the facts tell us that burning of fossil fuels is what causes the problem of climate change. That, there's no debate about that. So, right now, what is the responsible thing for governments to do? Should we be putting more big investments into fossil fuel projects, like what we are seeing uh, in the tar sands in Canada, or fracking in the United States, uh, because fracking, however the leadership wants to play it, is in fact a fossil fuel, right? It, yes, it's not as bad as oil, but when you fact, uh, or coal, sorry, if you factor in, though, methane gas release, water contamination, the impact on soil for agriculture and so on, you're talking about serious negative consequences. So, but one of the things, and let me take issue here with Dan and, and, and Simon. When we talk about the pricing, right, when we talk about the pricing of uh, fossil fuels versus renewable energy, one of the things that I want to say that all of us need to be a little more vocal and public about is the fact that one of the things we all forget is the distortion of pricing of fossil fuels because every year our governments globally put one in excess of one trillion dollars of taxpayer money to fund fossil fuel companies, right? Uh, and, and we can quibble about the figures and what impact it has and so on, but let's be very clear that when we actually talk about creating a fair enabling environment for renewables to actually succeed, we have to be very clear that the renewable energy industry as an emerging industry has had multiple, multiple barriers mm -hmm. being put. I mean, today the United States, and I'll say again something kind of controversial, today the United States is the best democracy that money can buy. And when you, <laughs> and when you interrogate, when you interrogate which money it is. Let me just give you one statistic. For every member of Congress, there is between three and eight full-time lobbyists paid by the oil, coal, and gas industries to ensure that meaningful, progressive climate uh, legislation doesn't go through. Now, let me say something about developing country governments. De developing country governments also have been looking too much for a free ride because they got a very convenient excuse. They can say, we didn't cause the problem. It's those buggers there that cause the problem, and they are still investing in fossil fuel projects, so why should we be so stupid not to invest? So when if I sit down to lobby, as I do, this, the chief negotiator of the Chinese government, he says, listen, we're ready to move, right? We're ready to move because we're seeing the drought in southwest China, we're seeing the uh, flooding that is climate-induced in several provinces, but 
it's economically suicidal for us to move when, in fact, those that built the economies, uh, you know, and then they give you all this thing, it's for the development and all. Let me take my country as an example, and I'll close with this. Basically, and I'm uh, happy to see some of my South African compatriots in the audience, uh, I would say that our government is talking about a trillion rand investment in nuclear, and is talking about further coal-powered uh, plants, and is talking with Shell about fracking, right? And they say, oh, you know, it's about development, it's also about uh, addressing the fact that the majority, uh, one in five South Africans is completely uh, energy poor. And by the way, that statistic at the global level, 1,6 billion in the people in the world do not have access to a single light bulb. And me, as an anti-poverty activist, I am committed to ensure those people have basic uh, uh, access. But they're not going to get it by building big coal-powered plants and big nuclear. If you want to do it quickly, safely, sustainably, and, 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 and in a way that in the long term is actually affordable for people, what we are talking about is decentralized micro-renewable energy provision. Right? And we can do it fast, we can do it quick, and, and, and you know, there are many examples where there is political will, right? uh, and, and in fact, even when there's not political will, right? if there is the kind of application you can do it. So essentially, I would say that if we are not addressing the energy question as forcefully as we should as at the global level, that in fact it's not an incorrect thing for me to say now, and you might think so, but I would say any further fresh investment in any fossil fuel projects is an investment in the debt of our children. That's what we need to understand it as. We as Greenpeace don't say that existing uh, fossil fuel projects can be switched off overnight. Of course, we recognize it has to be done in a planned and thoughtful way. And important to it is how we think about the social development win about an energy revolution. And several studies, not just Greenpeace studies, have shown that if we are smart in the way we rule out a energy revolution that needs to be at the scale that the industrial revolution was, we can have a double win, not only addressing the issue of uh, our meeting our energy needs, but also do it in a way that generates millions of new jobs in a new inclusive green economy that actually gives us a double win. And, and so long as we keep energy and development in, in two different boxes and, and, and the very many other boxes, the silos that we have, we don't stand a chance to actually address and avert catastrophic climate change. Great. Thank you very much. We, we have about 30 minutes now for questions, so we'll take them one at a time. And please try to keep them short so we can squeeze as many questions in as possible. Uh, yeah, why don't we start at the front? I'll get one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm David Simon, Sachs and Lineker, 1979. Some great contributions, but I think one of the oversimplifications in the discussion is with the singular form of the title, a paradigm or the model. And it seems to me that implicit in everything that's been said, whether it's about the way in which markets can be, and the functioning of markets can be improved, or indeed the fact that many of the poorest people in the world who face the most severe problems mm -hmm live in non-market or predominantly non-market context, although that too is changing, is that as long as we stop, continue to think in the singular, we're also perpetuating the problem. We need to think more pluralistically, that there is no one model that is going to work in Connecticut and a shanty town on the fringes of Same. a metropolitan area in wherever. Although the principles might be the same, but the relative importance of different factors and processes uh, will be very different. So we've got to have that sensitivity, which brings me to the other key point, which is that of scale. We've been talking exclusively at the global level. Great, absolutely. We need global governance and mechanisms, and they have to be enforceable. We need national governments as part of the process. But the problem is partly that the whole of the international system is still predicated on national governments. And there are several scales here that we haven't spoken about in terms of transnational and local. And that gets us to the other critical thing, which is boundaries. And Dan used the word jurisdiction. And the problem with climate change, <coughs> environmental contaminations, processes, resource extraction, uh, the globalized economy, is precisely that all these processes and forces transcend boundaries at every scale. So one of the challenges is to bring those things together. I work a lot with cities, and again, the 
point Kumi made about um, governments of poor countries using historical arguments rather self-defensively is absolutely right. The most polluted places on the planet are within low-income countries, within cities, and even within those there are huge inequalities. And I work a lot with cities, and the problem <coughs> there is very often that the metropolis transcends multiple local authority jurisdictions, and you might get one, the core municipality, to agree. They've got the capacity, they've got the tax base, etc., etc. They're well plugged into the C40 network and so on, and up to date with thinking. But right across the boundary, often sharing the same water courses, the same um, resource bases, are impoverished communities and local authorities that have almost no staff, no capacity, aren't even aware of some of the debates or the implications of legal change. To which, as Kumi knows, the South African Constitution is probably the first in the world that made um, the right to a safe environment a constitutional right. But is it justiceable in practice for poor people and poor communities? Those are some of the challenges we still have to address. We all agree. I think we agree. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Um, you Can everybody here speak up? If well, oh, but you're, you're taping. Yeah. Uh, Kumi had so many great one-liners. Um, I want to pick up on two of them. Um, first, um, he said that we need an energy revolution like the Industrial Revolution. I'm, I'm only an armchair historian, but the way I understood the Industrial Revolution <clears throat> uh, was uh, cheap goods that met consumers' uh, needs and preferences, and so people bought a lot of them. Um, so to the extent that grassroots movements can change consumer wants, needs, and preferences, that's probably a, a step in the right direction. But it's innovation that, that's got to happen to make these new things. The second phrase that, that, that I'll pick up on is Kumi said, if we have the political will. Now, The Economist changed its mind probably two years ago, and they said, uh, our politicians are, are so tangled up, we will never, ever get a carbon trading framework that works. So let's do a carbon tax as a fallback position. So those are comments, not questions. But. All right. Uh, gentleman behind. Yes. Please identify your, yeah. uh, where you're from as well. John Kirby, uh, Virginia, and Merton, is now a resident of Connecticut. <laughs> and aren't you excited about that cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable power that's coming every day? <laughs> I, I am excited, and I think you have, there's a great governor in Connecticut now. But I want to ask, as part of that uh, package that you're talking about, since you were the only person on the panel that really represents a jurisdiction, a single state, within Connecticut there are hundreds of villages, uh, towns, counties, municipalities, uh, and neighborhoods. Is there any part of that program which talks about micro-renewable energy? Places, is there any part of the program that will talk about wind power for a, a neighborhood? or a, a village. Is that any part of the Connecticut program? Well, I'm sorry you have to come across the ocean to get the answer to that question. <laughs> that suggests I haven't done my job as well as I should. Um, you heard me say, cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable, because that's what I think the public wants. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Connecticut has been hit not by one, but by two hurricanes in the last three years, and by two <clears throat> major snow and ice storms and all four of those storms knocked out power to at least half the state, and some people were without power for more than a week. Uh, all of which led to a real push for uh, a focus on resiliency and on the ability to uh, really reframe what I would call the big electric grid, which has been the model of 20th century electricity distribution. So we in fact do have a strategy for what we call distributed generation and microgrids. Uh, we launched uh, a month ago, but obviously not with enough publicity, uh, an initiative to uh, fund the first p nine pilot microgrid projects, each of which will have at its heart a uh, distributed generation, small-scale power generation facility, uh, and maybe a gas turbine. Uh, we're hoping that a number of them will be fuel cells. There may be some that are anaerobic digesters. And uh, the goal is to have, out over time, beginning with these pilots, uh, critical public uh, safety facilities protected first, so police and fire stations, uh, hospitals, sewage treatment plants, prisons, um, but also to create <coughs> microgrids. And by the way, my view of a microgrid is not backup power. It's a 24-7 power, distributed power operation, <coughs> integrated with the grid 99.7% of the time, 
but islandable in a crisis, separatable from the grid and can stay up when the grid is down. And the innovation that we're doing in Connecticut is to also <coughs> try to hook up some number of critical commercial facilities in cities and towns, a grocery store, a gas station, a bank, a pharmacy, so that during prolonged outages, there will be pockets of power that is up and the burden on the public much reduced because there will be access to food, water, a place to charge a cell phone, which it turns out, by the way, is what people care about most um, in the modern day. And I think this idea of distributed generation, uh, kind of a, a web of electric transmission and distribution as opposed to one big grid, is the 21st century approach. Let's take a question from the back. Um, I think uh, Michael Plodge is uh, South Africa at large in St. John's. I think Dr. Naidu makes a good point that we need to act now and we, we really do stand on the precipice. But I wonder when we look at the instance of Germany, which has committed well over 300 billion euros to solar and wind and, and other renewables and, and is involved in a, a number of other climate initiatives. And, you know, despite over 25%, I think, of their power now coming from renewables, you have record CO2 output in Germany. And that's the direct result of, of the shutdown in various locations of their nuclear or of nuclear facilities. And, you know, while renewables, I'm sure, at some stage will be able to meet base requirements and, and variable peaking requirements, I wonder right now if Greenpeace is opposition to, to nuclear and, and their energy policy in general. I wonder if you worry if it's doing more harm than good right now. Okay. <clears throat> So, but by the way, Germany last year got close to 50 percent, not 25 percent. Uh, so, uh, but, but you see, uh, again, the reality is that if you look at the quantity of subsidies given to the renewable energy sector historically and presently in Germany, and what was given to nuclear fossil fuels, it's incomparable, right? So, and, and by the way, one of the arguments that we used with Angela Merkel when she eventually and the government decided to phase out nuclear was not only the <coughs> issue of energy, but also the issue of jobs. Uh, the nuclear industry generates 30,000 job, 30, jobs in Germany uh, with the, the you know, huge, huge subsidies running into the billions over time. And uh, the renewable energy sector with minuscule amount of subsidies is already generating in excess of 400,000 jobs. But just to be brief, the reason why Greenpeace <coughs> opposes nuclear is very simple. We consider it to be uh, too dangerous, uh, too costly, uh, and uh, too unsafe. And as a solution to climate change, which some of the people put it forward, will deliver too little too late. Because after Fukushima anyway, no country building a nuclear new nuclear plant is going to not increase the levels of uh, security and so on. And we are talking then about these nuclear projects which take long to build anyway, from 10 years construction to running, and, and we don't have that time. But let's just say, in my last comment, if people from the nuclear industry came before us, looked us in the eyes and said, we can guarantee that there will never be a terrorist attack on a nuclear facility, and we believe them. If they said, we can guarantee there will never be human error, you know, no human being working in a nuclear facility will ever make an error, and we believe that. If they said there will never be a technical failure, right, and we believe that. And if they said there will never be a tsunami-like incident that will impact on it, and we believe that. Let's assume all of that was true. One of the things that the nuclear industry cannot do is look us in the eye and answer this question, that they have found a safe solution to the storage of spent nuclear waste. Essentially, what we are doing is we're passing this problem to future generations. Uh, and the image I'd like you to have in your mind when you think about this is think about archaeologists today. <coughs> when they go and do their work, they find artifacts, buildings, villages, temples, and so on that our ancestors left. Archaeologists in the future will find the most poisonous, toxic uh, waste mm -hmm. because it takes, depending on what nuclear mixture is. It takes between 200 to 1,000 years before that waste actually becomes safe again. So for all of those reasons, we say that in fact you can invest that same amount of money in a growing number of options in the renewable energy sector 
get the electricity generated much more faster without the uncertainties and the risks associated uh, with uh, nuclear, and that is why we are opposed. Uh, yes. Thank you. Varun Sivaram, uh, California and St. John's, 2011. I want to probe the complicated relationship between environmental advocacy groups and policymakers um, when they require each other but often disagree. In Los Angeles, we relied on the Sierra Club to get the support to mobilize lobbying for city council members to get us off of coal power. But man, they weren't happy when the replacement strategy consisted of natural gas and nuclear. Similarly, Commissioner Esty, the Connecticut Comprehensive Energy Plan, has a plank that natural gas heating should be increased, which will certainly drive down emissions, but Greenpeace calls natural gas a bridge to nowhere. How do you guys collaborate when you share a strategic vision but differ on tactics? Hmm. You start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think one of the interesting uh, uh, challenges in life, and one of the things I feel lucky, is to uh, spend some of my time in an academic setting observing from afar, sometime lobbying and uh, advocating, uh, and then sometime in government. And uh, one of the things I like to say that makes government challenging is you can't really be a good decision maker and the darling of the communities that pay attention. So you can't be the darling of the environmental community if you have to actually make trade-offs and choices. Uh, and I think our strategy, which is proposing a substantial build-out of natural gas infrastructure to displace <coughs> the burning of oil uh, for heating and industrial purposes, offers a very positive approach to not only greenhouse gas emissions, but local air pollution out over the next couple of decades. And I think it would not be a good strategy if it weren't uh, paired with the major commitment to efficiency and to renewables that you heard me talk about earlier. And the honest truth is that the environmental community is arrayed uh, in how it uh, supports or doesn't support this mix of policies. A number of groups um, are quite pleased with the whole package. And others, uh, and I don't think Greenpeace is that focused on Connecticut, but others uh, like Greenpeace would say, no, 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 well, we can't abide the part that is about building out natural gas infrastructure. But I think the pairing of short, middle, and long-term strategies is what people in government have to do. Uh, and I think that's where you get progress going, even if not at the pace which Kumi calls for, which you know, I believe he's actually right. And the only question, echoing Simon's opening comment, is whether we're actually getting anywhere. And I think getting somewhere is better than getting nowhere. Kumi? Uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think, you know, from our side, obviously we understand that politics is a balance of addressing different competing interests and when people get elected in power they have to look at what business is saying what government is, uh, what voices in parliament and governing institutions and what civil society is saying and to be fair to them civil society doesn't always speak in one unified voice but to also be fair business or government or parliament never That's speaks exactly. in one voice either yeah. uh, but having said that you know the, the, there is a bigger issue here and, and given this 110th anniversary, it's worth making. Because this, for me, is an issue that goes to the quality of democracy. <clears throat> I don't think it's, it's disconnected from democracy. Because, you know, in a sense, democracy was to balance the wallet by the ballot, right? The ballot was to provide a counterbalance to people <clears throat> with excessive wealth, right? Or a lot of wealth. And, and, and unfortunately, how that plays out quite <coughs> often in real politic means that poor people, working people, and the environment lose in favor of the most powerful uh, moneyed interests that actually shape the policy making. So from our point of view, and, and I know you laughed when I said, you know, we have this thing, no permanent friends, no permanent uh, enemies. But that's the way, I mean, like, I'm engaging with a range of heads of state, for example, which, you know, I would... You know, I wouldn't want to be seen at a dinner party with them in my private room, right? Because I've got fundamental issues around the human rights record and, and so on. I chaired a meeting with Putin at his house uh, several years ago to talk about climate change. And, you know, I will go and have that conversation because it's the right thing to do. These people have the power to make the changes and we cannot take uh, politically 
uh, purist positions and believe that we are so important and so pure that by engaging with people with difference that in fact it contaminates us. And I should say that I owe, personally, I owe a big debt, uh, as many of us in my country do, to the leadership of Nelson Mandela and what he actually taught us. Because if you think about the biggest message of his life, is that irrespective of our distance, uh, the differences, humanity has an obligation to actually search for common ground. Search for common ground, but not search for the lowest common denominator. And that's the difference. Uh, I think we have to, you know, struggle with. Quickly, Simon, did you want to add to that? No, no, there's okay. more questions. Um, <coughs> yeah. Hi, Charlotte Opal, North Carolina and St. Anthony's, 1997. Oh, that's not for me. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to echo David's point about not a paradigm, but we need to fight on all fronts. And I, start my, uh, I work more on the market and consumer movement, so in fair trade, and then I work for an NGO that actually picks companies up who've been run over by a Greenpeace campaign and helps them implement whatever they promise Kumi they will do. Um, so I very much believe in that model. The regulatory model uh, is very, they're not doing a good job protecting us from chemicals that we put on our farms. And we, if anyone read Bad Pharma by Ben Goldacre, which was a best-selling book here, I can tell you that the chemical industry for agriculture is the same thing with a revolving door with industry and regulators. and. Uh, hidden science and all of that. And then in developing countries, this permitting process might take a week in Indonesia. It takes a week to put money in someone's pocket and then you find out that the concession <coughs> to cut down the forest behind you was given out without you even knowing. So um, regulatory answers yeah, are not yeah. functioning. But at the same time, the consumer and market movements are slow. It's taken us 30 years in the US and Europe to build up a movement for people to look for labels and ask companies to do better. And now we have all these incredible middle class, richer people in India and China, and where do we start with them? So to not get lost in this wicked problem, I think we have to have everyone, all of us as consumers, doing what we can every day when we buy products, but and in our organizations, working on these multiple fronts at the local government level, at the uh, NGO campaign level, everywhere, because if there's not a paradigm, I'm afraid. No, oh, you're right, absolutely. Yes, we all agree, and, and I think harnessing consumer power has got to be part of the broad set of strategies. <laughs> I promise somebody over there. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Michael Stein, South Africa at large, 88. In fact, we inherited from Kumi uh, a group of scholars. Kumi is here before us, bro, scholars of <coughs> Pipeline. And I remember full well when Bishop Desmond Tutu came back in 1989 on his way back from New York from the Chase Manhattan bankers where he and Bayers Nordi had persuaded the Chase Manhattan bankers not to renew the South African government loans. But I think the lesson is here that you need both the carrot and the stick. And what they were able to do, these two passionate South African leaders, was to be able to persuade the Chase Manhattan bankers that they were going to face a massive black American boycott of their bank. And they blinked. And they didn't renew the South African loans. And the South African currency collapsed literally within that week, and if you recall that week to me. And that is when Nelson Mandela, that night, I believe, or later that night, was whisked off from uh, prison uh, to meet with de Klerk. So I think there's got to be a real sense of, of stick. And one of the ideas, and might be very unpopular to the Canadians in the audience, but to watch a, a, a TED talk by a great Canadian called Garth Lenz on the Canadian uh, tar sands. Now, we're all downstream of the Canadian tar sands, and Canada likes to project and has projected itself very <coughs> amazingly into the world as a wonderful nation, and it is, until Canadian tar sands. We are all downstream of Canadian tar sands in terms of the, the CO2 emissions. <coughs> so one idea, one concept could be for Greenpeace and everybody in the world, the consumer movement that the previous question was about, was to say, can we actually make an example of someone and get them to blink? Go and speak to Harp and say, we will have a boycott of all Canadian goods globally, we will not go there. I personally won't go there after having watched that TED talk. Because frankly, we are downstream of this toxicity coming out of the Canadian tar sand. So that would be for me an example. Of, of, of We're lining up tanks to right now. Okay, thank you. So we are running close to the end, and I'll, I'll let's go over by a few minutes, just to squeeze in a few questions, try to keep them short. Gentlemen at the front. <coughs> Uh, Tim Weisfeld, Bailey, 69. I'm curious if any of you on the panel, or in fact those of you in the room, are nervous about the underlying metaphors we've been using today, because in effect we're sliding into vocabulary that gets us nowhere fast. We're, look, we're looking at things like 
I think you used the phrase um, green growth, for example. It's, uh, it's now coming into the vocabulary of sustainable growth, as if that's possible, that kind of oxymoron. Or nuclear safety, um, you know, probably not. Or business ethics, or, you know, <laughs> or for that matter, military intelligence. I mean, we, we, we seem to accept terminology that is absolutely incoherent. And green consumerism is not going to get us there. Why? Well, because it's to the consumerism that's driving the problem. Now, whether or not we get more efficient at it is very amply demonstrated by Dan. I mean, it, you can't get a better person at getting better delivery of services, bang for the buck, whatever you want to use. But at some point, he's not in inviting people to self-impose self-restraint. He's delivering more energy to them more cheaply. And in a culture that's dominated by consumerism, all that's going to do is hasten and make more efficient extinction. Thank you, Dan, would you like to defend yourself? Um, like, <laughs> you want to start? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I think it's a very important point that you've made, and I've actually banned anyone in my team using the word paradigm because I think it just produces this big mush of everything is in there together. Green growth was a concept that the OECD pioneered a year before I arrived, and we finalised the report a year after I'd arrived. Um, one of the first things I do when I'm talking about it is to put up a slide which says green growth is not a whole series of things. And the first one I start with is a slogan. Now, uh, you could argue with that, that by definition it is a slogan. Okay, if you're going to use slogans, you have to be prepared to expose them to very, very searching scrutiny, which is why what we've tried to do is to develop some very hard quantitative empirical indicators, which I suspect if you applied them absolutely honestly, would show that absolutely no one is generating green growth. It's a question of how far away you are from that boundary. So we end up in a world of relativism where it's okay, some are doing more than others, some are achieving more than others, what can we learn from them? I mean, just You mentioned jobs. I have to just, I, I resisted taking you up, but I mean, we, the, the organization I work for, tries to help 34 countries be objective about what they do. We don't believe there's any evidence, unfortunately, much as we'd like to find it, empirically, of there being a jobs bonanza around the green growth thing. Um, there may be short run, but all the evidence is that there's job churn, that people move out of industries which are in decline, they move into growing ones. If there's many, many more people in renewable energy, well, that may be because it's actually at the beginning of its life so inefficient. The first thing business will seek to do is to radically reduce that cost. Uh, and you would expect that, that, that that's perfectly rational. So I, I, I think we need to be extremely careful. We're, we're living in a world of absolute label type talk when in fact we're living in a finite planet and we're still demanding more of it. And by the way, you know, all the models suggest you're gonna add another two billion people, we're gonna quadruple GDP by the middle of the century. The only conceivable way you could really, really win this one is to completely dematerialize growth. And conceptually, conceptually, you could imagine a world where goods and services had been so radically dematerialized that you were living within a footprint. That's a very, very big challenge. So I think people like you need to keep saying that because otherwise we do drift into temporary <coughs> havens of comfort around all encompassing concepts which actually aren't where we're going. So I, I, I thank you for the question. But that's not a reason not to use those ideas to try to mobilize people in a very different and less uh, resource intensive uh, direction. So I'll now play the role of Simon and say, and, and Kumi for that matter, and say the challenge is political will. Mm -hmm. If you tell the public that the price of getting this done uh, is a, a diminished world of less energy uh, and of greater suffering, they're not going to go there. And that, it's frankly, like is the challenge, and it's that is why we've made very little progress. So I think the solution is innovation, it is technology breakthrough, it is dematerialization. Um, as my friend Amory Lovins likes to say, it's not that people want hot water heaters or refrigerators. They simply want hot showers and cold beer. And if we can deliver them what they want in a much less energy intensive polluting way, 
we will get where we need to go. Check the portal loose for my point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one last question. Uh, I'm Subhadra Kapagoda, wife of a Rhodes Scholar, Sri Lanka and Kiba. But I'm Canadian. I'm ashamed of the Tasans. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm absolutely ashamed. But what I want to ask you is, why is the environment not being taught, saving the environment in schools? I was talking to the head of a Montessori school teacher, and I asked her, and she said, parents want the children to learn their ABCs and 1, 2, 3s, not about saving the environment. It doesn't seem to be taught at the bottom levels of schools anywhere, as far as I have found out. I, I think Could schools are question? actually critical. Uh, the, the, the question is why you is, the question, please? Why is uh, sensitivity to the environment and some of the issues of sustainability that we've been talking about not taught in schools? <coughs> and I actually think it is taught in schools is, in many, many places. Yeah. And in fact, it's the critical pathway to progress that I see, because it turns out it's much easier to get young people to widen their thinking and open their minds than some of us who have uh, advanced further down the age cycle. So I do think schools are critical, and I think they are doing a pretty yeah. good job, actually. It's variable, but yeah, no, it's certainly, if it's one of the things we track at the OECD with our member countries, these things, I mean, yes, all countries are to some extent. Uh, it's variable. Yeah, no, I, I agree that it's happening, but I think uh, your question is so well taken because given the scale of what is at stake here, you would have thought that there would be a massive kind of explosion that is a little bit more driven from the top. Because actually, quite often, uh, what I'm seeing in South Africa is innovative things happening in the educational environment is coming from the bottom. Mm. That in fact, it is progressive teachers or progressive mm. school principals who are actually doing it mm. without too much of formal support or encouragement mm. from the top. But I didn't have a chance to answer that last question. And I, and I do want to say that folks, if there's one question I appeal to you that you take away from today's session, take away that question. Because that question is actually, in a very honest way, posing the contradiction that we find ourselves. And when I said our leaders are in denial and we're suffering from cognitive dissonance, they're not willing to address this question. Because the bottom line is, if we are to deliver, not to the additional two billion people that will be born in the next coming decades, but just to the seven billion people that live on this planet, what all of us in this room take for granted, right, in terms of material consumption. According to our friends at WWF, we would need as much as three to eight more planets, right? right? So, so just think about that, right? Because we, and, 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 and the one thing that I would say, Dan's absolutely right about how difficult it is to work with people's expectations on consumption. But let's not be, uh, let's also ask ourselves, how did people get to that point of expectation, right? It didn't just happen. And I refer you to a book by uh, a US uh, sociologist called Benjamin Barber called Consume, with the subtitle, How the Advertising Industry Infantilizes Adults and uh, so sort of infantilizes adults, you know, life, uh, what the, you know, anti-aging and all of that, and, and corrupts the young. Because don't understand, consumption patterns are actually manufactured, and we need to look at those that actually create those phenomena. Because bottom line is, if we think we can actually secure the future of our children by averting catastrophic climate change without addressing the excessive consumption, particularly in the developed countries of the world, and particularly, by the way, by the elites in developing countries, because I can tell you the worst consumption patterns you find is actually the elites in developing countries. And sadly, my own country now has some really good examples that I can share with you, but I'd rather not because I don't want you to depress. All right, well, um, I think getting back to the beginning of the conversation, it's clear that a new world is coming, but we have a lot to do to make it both sustainable and equitable. And to, again, end with a quote from the same speech by Aaron Dati Roy, what can we do? We can learn from our history, but we can continue to build public opinion until it becomes a deafening roar. So thank you very much to the panelists. We can continue the conversation over lunch. And please join me in thank you. Thank you.